Welcome to Email After Hours by Senderscore, powered by Validity. We're your hosts. My name is Guy Hansen. And I'm Danielle Gallant, and this is Email After Hours. Today, we're plunging deep into a subject that's embarrassing, relatable, and something we've all received in our own mailboxes at some point. Those infamous oops emails. And we've all been there. We've all sent emails that in a swift click shoot off to our colleagues, bosses, or worse, an entire mailing list revealing our hasty typos or forgotten attachments or premature thoughts, maybe. In this hyper-connected age, such slip-ups are always just around the corner. Like I said, we've all been there. And honestly, the aftermath is always cringeworthy to recall. But with the right strategy, there are ways for brands to navigate these mistakes without losing face with their subscribers. And lucky listeners, it's a host-only episode, so you are stuck with Guy and I for the next half an hour or so. We've lined up some hilarious stories, handy advice, and perhaps a sprinkle of unexpected moments just for you for this episode today. Are you ready to discuss some email faux pas, Guy? Yeah, including a few of my own. I hate to say it, but there's a Oops, emails. It's a pet topic of mine, and I think it is yours as well, Dan. You know, we, we've all seen them. Everyone hates making mistakes. That goes for me too. And listen, it's a pain because it takes time to from often deploy those apology emails. But sometimes, you know, there's an upside because oops, emails often really stand out in busy inboxes. You know, they grab subscribers' interest and. Uh, if you're really lucky, you know, a good oops email can even outperform, you know, the original containing the mistake. Isn't that right? That's absolutely right. Much to the chagrin of yeah. marketers everywhere. <laughs> Despite the embarrassment uh, that marketers might feel or the time that they ultimately have to dedicate to fixing any mistakes, oops emails are absolutely necessary. They are a must in the eco, uh, email ecosystem. After all, we must all apologize eventually. Guy, thinking back to your life as a sender, pre-return path or validity, were there any major screw-ups that you were directly involved with and that you're willing to tell me about today? <laughs> wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> here, 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 here we go. May I call the number one? So um, back in my agency days. We used to send emails for the ZZ pizza chain. And this was way back when having a, a nicely crafted plain text copy was an important part of the email. So when we did our proofing, we actually had a special switch which we flicked in our platform so that it proofed two copies. And everybody on the proofing list got the HTML version and they got the plain text version. And one dismal day, we forgot to <laughs> off the proofing flag. And 750,000 ZZ customers all received two emails. You know, the HTML version cool. and the plain text version. And we went into the office that morning and all had kicked off. Our, our client was really mad and there was like swearing and recriminations. And <laughs> We bought ourselves a little bit of time and said, listen, we just need to run some analysis and figure out what happened. I suddenly realized that this campaign's response rates were going up and up and up. And in the end, we turned to their record performing campaign for the year. And probably what was happening was that sort of many of the recipients who actually didn't get the HTML version because it ended up in their junk folder suddenly got the plain text version and thought, hey, we're in the mood for pizza. So <laughs> the, a sort of Monday that started really badly ended up a load better. You know, it's easy to talk about this topic, though, you know, and I mean, you know, people might accuse us of getting all self-righteous, but, uh, you know, having talked about an example from a, a previous life, um, you know, let's reassure our listeners, we, we've had one or two of these uh, validity as well, haven't we? You know, we have, we have, we all have them. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, I, I remember back in the day and uh, we, we sent out multiple language versions, English, French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, 
And uh, we managed to mix up the content of the data and send a, a German language email to all our customers in South America. And the funny thing is they were really forgiving. You know, they were so nice about it, you know, sort of many sort of actually sent us emails back saying, um, you know, great opportunity to practice their language skills. And, uh, you know, the, the, some, some of them even replied in German. It's sort of down, there's quite a few German speakers in that part of the world. So, uh, again, you know, from that expected mistake, you know, it was quite funny. Some of the responses we got. Well, and we made a mistake fairly recently um, after or with one of our state of email emails, <laughs> which was sent out without a, or without a working registration link. The link just wasn't working. Um, and it happens, right? It happens even to the best of us. But what's important is that we immediately owned up and sent out a follow up. And we were able to do this in a pretty um, segmented way because we knew who opened the email, but didn't click. And so we created a segment specifically based off of that criteria. And to go back to, you know, oops, emails outperforming regular business as usual messages, which they very often do, it turned into our best performing email of the year. It had an 88% open rate and a 91% click rate. And just for the listeners, I'm not sure you'll know who this is, but this was much to Juliana's relief, right, Guy? <laughs> Absolutely. Juliana was delighted that it ended up being such a like, warming email. But, you know, now we're starting to get towards, you know, some of the more serious aspects of today's conversation. We will try to be serious, I promise. But, you know, we'd like to think that in preparing that recovery email, we ticked a few best practice boxes. You know, we were honest about what had happened and we moved quickly to fix the problem. And, you know, we used a bit of humor. Oops, let's try this again. And hopefully we handled it reasonably well. But, you know, Danielle, we've all seen this. What are the hallmarks of a good recovery email, you know, versus a bad recovery email? Yeah, there are a couple. And, and frankly, it is really easy to have a bad recovery email go out. It's the last thing we want to add a mistake on top of a mistake. We do not want to stack those, right? So there are a couple of key elements that marketers need to be aware of and that need to come together to have a successful oops email, a successful mm -hmm. recovery email. And the first one is act quickly. The sooner you realize you've made a mistake, the sooner you should take corrective action. Um, this is especially true for time-sensitive campaigns, which as we come to this this part of the year, as we get into holiday season, they are all over the place, these time-sensitive campaigns. So to ensure subscribers can still take advantage of you know, key sales events, send an oops email as soon as possible. And in fact, some senders can even catch a mistake before the campaign has finished deploying. Um, so then you can create those segments that we were talking about before, like who does it make sense to send this oops email to? It may not even be your whole audience. Uh, this is going to sound maybe obvious, but you should actually apologize <laughs> in your apology email, in your oops email, in the event of an oops, a simple and authentic we're sorry goes a really long way. A well-crafted apology can help mitigate any complaints, those pesky spam complaints that are going to come through, whether it's through your email channel uh, and through your feedback loop or through your customer service team or even through social channels. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it sounds it sounds basic, but definitely definitely issue an apology in your oops because you did make a mistake. On to number three. This is so important and often goes overlooked. So be clear and be specific about what exactly is being corrected. The oops email should provide subscribers with a summary or overview of the issue. And we're not talking like a paragraph, but a simple statement that makes clear, for example, an out of stock item was promoted or that your website was experiencing technical, uh, technical difficulties. Being honest is going to help create a rapport with your audience. And your customers will usually appreciate that transparency. You know, when you were talking about actually apologize, I was thinking about like, my son when he was about four. And you think you like commit one of those egregious events where, you know, you almost had to force him to. And, you know, he had standing up like, staring at his shoes and, you know, eyes shut going, I'm oh, sorry. And uh, <laughs> it reminds me of that. But, 
I think, you know, what you were just talking about, being clear, being specific, and yeah, it, it brings into focus the importance of a subject line. Subject lines are always important for emails. They're specifically important for um, apology emails. But how should we be thinking about them? Are we trying to create attention to the mistake? Or are we trying to sort of sneak it in and hope nobody notices? What's the role of the subject line? Yeah, I think we want to be clear. We want to be clear that uh, we are we have made a mistake. Oops, we're sorry. Let's try that again. Something that makes it very obvious because A, we want to be transparent, but B, we also want to grab attention. Anything that is out of the ordinary for a subscriber to receive um, you know, from your brand is going to catch the eye. Uh, and we can use... Uh, the subject line, of course, we need it to be compelling um, and very clear to subscribers that the email contains a correction. But there's some other real estate in that area that I know you're particularly passionate about, Guy. <laughs> Want to tell us about that? Uh, uh, yeah. So, you know, with every subject line, there should be a great pre-header as well. And I think, uh, you know, letting the pre-header tell part of the story is part of the success. Um, and, uh, Saw a nice example literally just this week. Um, our, our friends at Movable Inc. made a small mistake. It, nothing, nothing earth shattering. And um, their recovery subject line: "We made a mistake." And then nicely complimented by the pre-header, which read, "Sorry, and um, thanks so much for understanding." Yeah, you know, it just felt very natural. So, what else have we got to think about? You know, in terms of the way that subject line and pre-header in a recovery email can complement each other. Well, I just wanted to actually make one more note about the importance of creating a, dis uh, a unique subject line, because I have seen senders deploy um, essentially the exact same email with the exact same subject line with a link corrected or something, but, but we're not made aware of that. Um, and if the same email from the same sender goes out within a really short time frame, mm -hmm. um, some mailbox providers will group those. So it'll it'll look like it's actually one email sent twice. It'll look like uh, your correction was a mistake in and of itself. So it's really important to tweak that subject line, create you know a complimentary pre-header, uh, as you said, Guy. But there are, of course, a few more things that we want to pay attention to or that really help bring together an oops email. And one of those is sweetening the deal a little bit. Create an incentive that encourages subscribers to accept your apology. And sometimes this is necessary and sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes an apology is enough and you can redirect subscriber focus to you know, the correct link or different products. Uh, but depending on the severity of the error and in the more serious mistake cases, <laughs> senders might consider maybe offering free shipping, a special percent off promotion or you know something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, Again, not always necessary, but if you've made a really big mistake, then it could be it could be worth, uh, you know, reattracting and retaining those subscribers with just a little bit of a gift. And I want to go back to one thing you mentioned right at the top, Guy, which was humor. Mm. Sometimes use humor, right? Laugh at yourself and the world laughs with you. But that is not always the case, is it, Guy? I think... Like you said a moment ago, it depends on the situation. And I think in my mind, generally, you know, providing the situation wasn't too bad, you know, providing nobody got seriously hurt, then absolutely, I think humor is a great way just to take the edge off what's happened a little bit. But I think the, the cardinal rule is don't make the mistake of just treating the mistake as a big joke. Um, I think this is a classic case of, you know, wanting to laugh and bring the world along to laugh with you, um, you know, at your expense a little bit. But, uh, you know, if you can get that right, then absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a nice way of sort of defusing what can otherwise be a awkward situation. Yeah, absolutely. And we've, we've gone through now the top things that marketers should remember when they're sending out an apology email actually apologize, act quickly, let the subscribers know what went wrong. But let's get a little bit more memorable. Guy, any memorable oops emails to share? Well, probably my all-time favorite um, was our friends at lastminute.com. 
And in fairness to them, this happened during the COVID pandemic and we were all working from home and sort of dealing with the challenges of kids and pets, you know, running around your you know, office space. And uh, they made a mistake similar to the one that we just described and uh, sent out a German copy to their English speaking audience. And they realized in fairly quick order what had happened. And they sent out an apology email. And it turned out it actually was the campaign exec's cat. And they blamed the whole thing on the cat. And the cat had walked across the keyboard and actually accidentally hit send before they met to. And uh, it generated a hugely positive response because it was just empathy in action. You know, we were all in the same boat. You know, we were all dealing with those challenges at home. And, uh, you know, they, they handled it beautifully. I think um, a recent example, a um, little brand called Blue Kazoo. And uh, I've actually got a copy of this email with me. And it was embarrassing for them because they, they sent out their email prematurely and uh, the special offer wasn't working yet. And they apologized and they crafted a special offer with a, a code that customers could redeem for an additional discount. And the code, if you not, was hashtag Friday F ups. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which demonstrated beautiful awareness of, you know, hey, it was a Friday and we're sorry. And, uh, yeah, have an extra discount at our expense. It, it was a very nice recovery. Those are great examples. I love them. I think they're so, um, clean, crisp, genuine, right? So that's, I think, where that authentic, empathy comes from well, hashtag um, I but I, don't mean. <laughs> <laughs> I meant clean like <laughs> the idea was clean yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 you're right <laughs> what am i talking about <laughs> <laughs> now okay i'm gonna transition from my giggles to uh, a shared pet peeve of ours i think guy we have seen a lot of brands who deliberately create the impression of an apology email, even though it is not an apology email. That's They're doing that because they know it's an effective tactic to get attention. So, you know, we're so sorry, dot, dot, dot. These deals won't last forever. Um, Want to tell After Hours listeners how we feel about this? Okay. Do you want the long answer or the short answer? I mean, the short answer is, you know, as a practice, it seriously sucks. Um <laughs> Uh, you know the way I see it, you know, it's, it's like calling your kids for dinner and you're promising them ice cream and they get to the dinner table and they're all excited and then you tell them they've got to eat their spinach first. You know, it's like a serious, you know, excitement burster, you know, sort of creating that initial free song of anticipation and then follow by crushing disappointments. You know, I really can't believe that it's good for subscriber engagement. What do you think? No, it can't be. I, I would imagine that subscribers would feel duped, right? They would feel misled and you would then see the unsubscribes or the spam complaints come rolling in. That's my, uh, you know, that's my guess about that. But um, we know and we've talked about, you know, apology emails are usually sent out as the result of an email mix up. So something went wrong with the previous version. Um, but there are broader reasons to send an apology email, or are there even? Maybe it's not just about mistakes. Um, subscribers want a relationship with the brand they shop from. So any negative encounter in store with a product, et cetera, might warrant some sort of apology email. We talk a lot about the DMA on this podcast, as everybody knows, and go back and listen to that episode. Uh, research shows around one in six spam complaints are resulting from external factors, so non-email factors, like a bad store experience, um, like bad press coverage. Guy, I, we were talking about this episode a couple days ago, and you have a bit of a recent and very real-life oops from the UK, right? Can you tell us about that? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very interesting story. So, um, yeah, here in the UK, Bowdoin is a very famous... Um, homewares brand and Johnny Bone, the founder, is about to send an email to all his customers, basically making a 
uh, unconditional apology to them for the way that he's managed the business over the past few years. Um, you know, they, they, they've taken a couple of wrong terms and now they're axing their struggling menswear business and they're re-implementing their much-loved product catalogue, which um, you know is actually what brought Bowden to fame in the first place. And uh, over the next week or so, Johnny is going to send out an apology email to all of his loyal customers, and apparently it's going to include phrases such as, sorry, I'm a complete nitwit, I F. <laughs> so if you're a Bowdoin customer, keep an eye on your inboxes because this is on your way. And you know what, even if you're not a Bowdoin customer, you should probably sign up quickly because it's getting me worth it just to see this email. <laughs> you heard it, UK listeners. <laughs> <laughs> sign up right now. You know what? There was also one other thing I wanted to mention, Danielle, because I think occasionally, you know, and it comes back to the joke of trying to force your toddlers to apologize, but, you know, you see an email that you really think ought to be apologized about and isn't. And um, our colleague, Jess, shared uh, an email with us the other day and she couldn't quite believe what she'd received. Um, I'm not going to name and shame the sender, but the copy read, Hey, it's your neighbor right across the street. You know, the one with the silver copper and the little dog. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know that everyone in the neighborhood can see you walk around your house in your underwear all day. And I just wanted to give you the heads up that if you're looking for some really comfy shorts to walk around in, you can go and get them from XYZ in Boreham. I just, it's so creepy. Right. It's so, so creepy. And that's that's an example of humor gone wrong, because I think they were probably just trying to. I don't know. I don't know what they were trying to do. <laughs> I'm horrified and I'm embarrassed for them. As we said at the top, these emails are embarrassing. But yeah, that one would definitely warrant an apology. Um, so accept feedback. So listen, I think um, those are great examples, but um yeah, our audience is probably sitting there thinking, what do we do with this? You know, senders need to have a plan in place, you know, rather than waiting for that mistake to happen, you know, have a have a have a mediation strategy ready to roll. And, you know, whether it's a missing link in the email or a major brand crisis, how are you gonna take care of your customers? How are you gonna be sincere? How are you gonna make that apology resonant? So Danielle, over to you. When the shit hits the fan, what's your plan? <laughs> I've been waiting. I've been waiting for this moment in this podcast, guy. But I mean, so yes, everybody needs to have a strategy, as you've said. And whether it doesn't mean that an email needs to be built, but at least uh, the concept of brand, res uh, brand, you know, management or crisis management or even just you know what is our tone that we want to strike but for our listeners today if anyone listening would you know like to learn more about the impact of oops emails and ways to work around them you should check out the validity blog there are several faux pas entries in there mm -hmm. uh, as well as a whole host of other tips and tricks for recovering from an email marketing mistake because again marketers we're all gonna make one at some point. Um, I We're about to wrap up and we are going to now, instead of as we usually do, posing a question to our guest, I'm going to pose one to you, Guy. Um, we have in the past talked about our musical tastes or maybe lack thereof on email after hours. Is there a song that comes to your head when you think about apologies? <laughs> 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 there's a few but i think one that does come to mind and uh this is almost going to be a halfway serious answer there's a great irish band called the hot house flowers and one of their early songs was simply called i'm sorry and uh, when it kicks off liam their singer he's reminiscing about events in his younger life that he could have probably should have handled better and it sort of opens up with comes a time in every man's life when he's got to look over his misdemeanors, misgivings, and misfortunes, and miss whatever her name was. That's <laughs> it. And the song goes on. 
about this apology that he's going to construct for you know all the wrongs that he wants to write. And there's a serious point to it because you know what he's saying is you know if you're going to do it right, you got to recognise and you got it wrong. Don't make excuses. Just make it right. It's a great song. That's such a sweet answer, Guy. <laughs> what after you said, when shit hits the fan, what's your plan? And I wish I had such a sincere example. But honestly, the only thing I can think of is the I'm sorry song that a lot of kids learn in like JK or preschool or pre-kindergarten or whatever. And now that I'm thinking about it, pretty much all of the steps that we've listed, act quickly, apologize, say what you did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> These are all being like, hopefully taught to kids. Um, and I will spare everybody um, the pain of letting me hum that tune for you and instead pass it over to Guy to wrap this up. <laughs> right. We, we, we've had a load of fun today. Um, this is the wrap. So uh, hope you've enjoyed it today, audience. And uh, when, when we put it up on uh, LinkedIn, if you've got any great apology examples, share them. Oh. It's a great conversation. We'd love to see them. Um, next time around, we're back to our regular format. We've got a great guest lined up, uh, Lauren Vistana from Drip.com, and we're going to be having an awesome conversation about effective email automation. So uh, join us again in two weeks' time. It's going to be fantastic. Bye for now. Be sure to tune in next time and hit subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And don't forget to visit senderscore.com for loads more great resources to help you become a stronger sender. To all you sleepless senders out there, thank you for joining us after hours and see you next time.